I'm Carla Zadnick. I'm Dean of the Ohio State University College of Optometry, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the sixth annual Jeffrey and Joyce Myers Lecture Series. Um, our speaker, as you can see from your program, is Dr. Don Korb, and I could read you the introduction that's in the program, but that wouldn't be very much fun. So let me see if I could think of perhaps an anecdote or two to tell about Don before he takes the podium. Um, the biography and what we learned about him this afternoon in an interview with Dr. Myers are his professional accomplishments along the lines of 50 patents um, and the, the things you see here. He is the quintessential clinician scientist. He is a private practitioner who has achieved all those things. And um, when he told us what he wanted to do more of, I would say he gave the response of the scientist part which is write more manuscripts, um, accomplish more things, get to more research ideas that I haven't gotten to yet. But a side of him that we didn't learn about this afternoon is one of dedicated service to the profession of optometry, specifically to the American Academy of Optometry. So here I look up and there's past president of the academy, Bob Newcomb, sitting right within my uh, gaze. And it reminded me that Don has done a lot for the Academy. And he shared with me some letters that he got immediately following the Academy meeting of 1969, praising him for the programmatic changes he had initiated at the Academy. And one of those letters um, came from Glenn Fry. He says, I want to particularly commend you for arranging speakers on special topics like evoked cortical potentials and corneal physiology. This brought the Academy to frontiers of knowledge where new things are happening. He finishes, you have done a remarkable job and deserve a word of praise for it. <laughs> um, likewise, he got a letter from Bill Baldwin, who's dean at the um, University of Houston, and he loved that Don had incorporated the following innovations. Grouping of papers with specially selected discussants and longer discussion periods, an emphasis on symposia, on timely subjects speaking by our well-qualified participants speaking on timely subjects. And he says, what makes your achievement even more remarkable is that you did most of the work yourself and took the substantial time required from the almost overwhelming demands of a very busy practice. And um, I have a recollection of Don when his wife, Joan Exford, was the first woman president of the American Academy of Optometry. Many of you have probably at the Academy been to the president's reception that closes out after the banquet. Everybody's nearly exhausted and doesn't you know, really want to consume much food or drink, but they soldier on at midnight. And I remember going to Joan's president's reception one year, and Don greeted everyone in a white apron, like a frilly French maid white apron at the door because he was, after all, the first gentleman of the Academy at that time. So likewise, in 1969, he received a letter commending him on the scientific program from E.J. Fisher, who was then president. Well, just let me tell you some of the names that were on the Executive Council of the Academy at that time. Dr. Carol Cope, Dr. Monroe Hirsch, Dr. Hank Peters, Garland Clay, Brad Wild, must have been a pretty lively group. And Dr. Fisher wrote Don, I want to express to you my deep appreciation for the excellent program you arranged and for the conduct of the meetings at the Academy. And close us with, I hope that you will now have a little more time to spend with that darling wife of yours. <laughs> so um, perhaps Don, in all of his achievements, might say that one of the greatest is that he married one Joan Exford. Um, but today he's going to tell us about his odyssey, his long trip uh, towards a new paradigm for meibomian gland disease. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Don. I don't think that of myself, my, my own uh, 
my own opinion of myself is my inadequacies, which are many, not my accomplishments. So I always try to keep that in mind because I think that's so true of all of us that if we look at what we have accomplished versus what we should have accomplished versus what we owe to this wonderful society that's allowed us to all be here today. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. And the question is, have we really, have we really, have we really expressed in the ways that we're able to uh, appreciation for that? And to Dr. Myers, I'm very, very appreciative of your uh, initiation and funding of activities which, which lead to that model. Uh, thank you very much. And as I mentioned to you when I was on the phone, I, uh, you've stimulated me to think of what I can do in the same vein to provide something a little bit different and a little bit more stimulating. The reason I titled uh, what I'm talking about as an odyssey is that an odyssey, I guess, is basically defined as a long and arduous journey with many ups and downs, and that certainly has been my uh, it's been my career. Uh, and I feel very fortunate that at my age and after 50 plus years, it's all culminated in a new paradigm, a real revolution in my thinking, and I believe in thinking that will change the entire culture of what we do and how we do it from a reactive stage to a, uh, a proactive stage where we'll think in terms of how to prevent rather than how to treat when all is lost. Uh, I should say that I have many commercial interests. The only thing wrong with them is what my wife says, Dr. Exford, and I'll walk slowly. And what my wife says, Dr. Exford, and what my children say, and they say, Dad, it's really great that you've been successful financially, but it would be even greater if you could be a little bit more successful. <laughs> 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 so I understand that. So that's the only regret that I have. But as I said today in an interview, uh, my founding of companies, and there's been five of them, uh, hasn't been because that was my intent. It was because many people apply for government grants and uh, not having had graduate degrees or not being a conventional person, I had to get financing somewhere. So under capitalism, most people, when they finance, you want uh, to see hope of getting it back. <laughs> um, the genesis. Well, the genesis of this entire change in my thinking and the entire uh, new revolution uh, isn't what one would expect. I'm sure. No, that's not He's right. digging for it. It'll, it'll stop before you get to it. It's not one of my old girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now we have the genesis of all this. And the question is, what would one expect? And can you believe that the genesis of all this came from what I was doing as a clinician? From contact lens discomfort, not comfort. So we should also always look at what we don't do well, not at what we do do well for our ideas. And this was truly the start of my particular odyssey. A little bad here. And all this happened when uh, I had worked out the concept of a membrane contact lens, which was the first contact lens that did a thickness that was of membrane type uh, quality and quantity. And the name of it was CSI. And in 1973, we had the first, uh, we had a daily wear. In 1974, we actually had the first extended wear IND in this country. Uh, and despite the fact that we could put a lens on nine out of 10 people's eyes, and they wouldn't feel it at all, it was absolute no sensation. They couldn't tell whether the lens was on the left or the right eye if you put only one in the eye. After a period of time, where hours, many of these individuals became uncomfortable. Well, how could that be? Because we couldn't see a thing. Well, that led me to investigate a completely different phenomenon. And the phenomenon which I became interested in was MGD. Because we made the observation that all these people we saw who had discom discomfort that couldn't be solved, and all the individuals who had discomfort uh, who were referred into us from other physicians and doctors and, and ODs, 
what we learned was that if we put them into a goggle with 100% humidity, bingo, they could wear their lenses. Well, that led me to thinking that it was probably something to do with oil because I knew that, well, I knew what a high school student knew in those days, uh, or maybe less, but I knew that oil didn't evaporate as quickly as water. So that led me to look at the meibomian glands. And I recruited uh, Tony Enriquez, who was an MD, PhD, and a board certified pathologist, among other attributes, and a coronary surgeon. And uh, Tony and I went at it. And what we discovered and published in 1980 was that the syndrome was basically due to an obstruction of the meibomian glands, obstruction. And that these glands, upon the application of pressure, uh, didn't yield any secretion, and this was due to an obstruction of the terminal duct. Well, this legacy probably is the most important thing that I've ever done, and it happened by accident, it happened by observation, which then led to certain experiments. Uh, but what's amazing about it is this was a preview of what has happened in the past five years, where MGD is now recognized universally by those who have studied it and by the most prestigious uh, committees that have ever been developed uh, as the leading cause of dry eye throughout the world. Now, how do we treat MGD from 1980 to the present? So, as clinicians, we're interested in treatment. If we're a researcher, we're interested in understanding the process. And if we're a developer, we're interested in developing something that would solve the problem or at least help the problem. So we came up with warm compresses. And warm compresses were. It doesn't work. I thought it did work. Well, it doesn't work. Uh, so warm compresses uh, were the first area. Uh, and we all know about warm compressors, and we'll chat about them in a moment. Then we had orifice scrubs, like lid scrubs and lid hygiene. Then we did manual expression, expressing the meibomian glands. Then we did bone training, and then we did drugs. But when we're talking about all of this, if I had the time, I'd go into great detail. There's actually 28 individuals who have contributed substantially to this field over the years. And one, of course, was Sir Eugene Wolfe, the anatomy of the eye in orbit, who was the first person to clearly differentiate the fact that there's three layers of the tear film. And he did that in 19, 1946. And then there's a whole host of other people who have contributed. But one name really stands, stands out, James Jester. He's probably, how many people in the room are aware of the fact of who Jester is and what he's done? I would be amazed if there's one. And, you know, he's your graduate student there. I have, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so your so your your mentor is punishing you with this useless information. <laughs> so he will know something about it, but he doesn't really want to do it himself. But he'd like you to synopsize it, and then he'll take credit for it. And that's a good program for older people. <laughs> so, so, so James Jasper, he's made some fantastic contributions. Now. Why don't want, why are not warm compressors ideal? Well, warm compressors are not ideal because see, this is really depressing. Uh, use the mouse. Can you use the mouse? Oh, uh, you know, it should be shoved over here. <laughs> <laughs> Only when you want to point it. Only when you want to point, you know. Uh, if we look at this red curve, and now we look at this point here. That is what happens on the inside of the lid where the meibomian glands are. So in a paper that we published in 2008, uh, and I should mention that a great deal of my work has been done with Caroline Black, and she's joined me for the last 10 years of my odyssey. And, uh, those have been the most productive years of the odyssey, so obviously Dr. Black is the person who really did it. And that's a point for you as a graduate student to remember. I don't know what you'll do with it, but you should remember it. <laughs> so uh, if we look at the outer lid, the temperature rises very quickly. So after only two minutes, uh, the temperature of a warm contrast applied at 45 degrees centigrade quickly rises, and it rises to about 42. And that will clean up the outer lid pretty well. 
uh, in terms of conventional thinking. Um, so, but the inlet, it really doesn't get. And the sweet spot, the sweet temperature for, for, for liquefying most material within the meibomian glands uh, is about 41 to 41 and a half. So it really never gets there for the, for the, for the lower lid when we use a warm compress. And then the next area um, is it took me 27 years to understand why orifice scrubs, which we prescribe, work. And an orifice scrub, in contrast to a regular scrubbing action in the lid, is when we apply the, the scrubbing mechanism, be it a Q-tip or a cotton applicator or something else, right directly to the lower lid margin on top of the meibomian gland. So we scrub back and forth. So I knew it worked. But we went 27 years to really understand it, and it wasn't until I became passionately interested in the line of Marx, and we translated the original paper by Marx, that we get some understanding of the importance of the mucocutaneous junction where the wet meets the dry. Then, it only took me another 28 years before the year 28 and 27 was beyond my mathematical ability. But the 28 years to quantify the limitations of manual expression. So on the slide on the left, that's how we used to express meibomian glands with the Q-tip, and we get all the jump from the Q-tip in the eye, including the glue, but that was okay, because it was so painful anyway. <laughs> and we published this in 1994, how this really was a therapeutic benefit, and it was a therapeutic benefit. And then more recently, we've upgraded to Kathy Mastrata's nice, stainless steel paddle because, you know, we feel better than the Q-tip. Although really it's not as good because you can quantify a Q-tip pressure by holding it in a certain manner and applying the pressure until it breaks. And then you know you have that pressure, but if you don't use that method with a stainless steel rod, you'll have fewer and fewer patients who, who, who are kind to you. Well, in 2008 or nine published in 2011, we built an apparatus to quantify the amount of pressure that would express a meibomian gland. And what we found is that most people with MGP with a terminal duct obstruction, it required somewhere between 10 to 20 PSI, pounds per square inch of pressure, to open the gland. Now let's put that in, and sometimes 30 and 40 pounds. Now let's, and of course that's extremely painful. And topical anesthesia doesn't work, and 1% lidocaine doesn't work. The only thing which works is injection of lidocaine right into the, right into the lid, in three, four, five, six places right across the lid. So this is not a real effective clinical technique. Uh, although now it's catching on, a lot of people are doing it. And as I've always said, you should always do it with those individuals where you're not particularly concerned whether they come back to you. <laughs> Those kind of patients who would like to send quotes packing. And this is a very effective method of doing it. You just keep applying the pressure and telling them that they have to come back by weekly for treatment. And you'll find that more often than not, they terminate their activity with it. So at any rate, uh, in these studies, we quantify the amount of pressure. And then we understood why that isn't as uh, effective as we well, let's talk about blinking. Well, I was amazed when I read my papers from 40 years ago on blinking because they're not bad. They're really not bad. Oh, well, they could be bad, but they're not bad. I mean, I, I understood how to teach blinking. But I had absolutely a level of success, which, uh, which was rather dismal, to say the least. And in 1970, I published my first paper on blinking as part of a, an addendum to a new method of contact lens design. And then, in 74, again, I published a number of articles. And then in 1994, I published an article showing that a deliberate blink increased lipid layer thickness unless the meibomian glands were obstructed. So now we have a whole panorama as to what blinking does. And we all know if you ever worked in a medical office that those people who have a paresis or some difficulty in medically blinking, they have a big trouble. Well, more recently, um, the lipid view, which uh, is, a, is an interferometer, which, is, which has a lot of unique features, 
um, allows us to measure the um, uh, allows us to measure the ratio or partial to complete blinks. And it just gives you a number. So this person here has no complete blinks. And we know empirically, and we know also from studies that we haven't published, that when the when the when the ratio of complete blinks to partial blinks is less than one in three, you have potential trouble. And as that ratio goes up and up and up, the chances of the individual being dry are, are more and more, are, are higher and higher. So this is a very, very, very valuable method of measuring partial blink. And I would predict that within 10 years, in every OD's office who does any significant work at all uh, at an academic level, where his practices at that level. For instance, you Sue, would certainly have a device so when the patient comes into you, you know what their blinking is. Because that's what governs the way you see, that governs the clarity, that governs the quality of the optical image, and that's one of the most important factors in the whole, in quotes, dry eye field. And we should remember that, that the anterior segment of the eye and our vision are really dynamic processes. They're not a static process because that lipid layer is constantly changing, and, it, and as it changes, your acuity will change. Then there was a whole method of treating the drugs. And again, just think, no matter what drug you place on an eye, whether it's a secretagogue, whether it's a steroid, metabolism, or what it is, how will that alter and obstruct it by going in? And I leave you with that thought. So whenever you're consider, considering using a steroid, okay, it's a palliative treatment. The person is in discomfort. Do what you have to do. But just think about what you're doing and why you're doing it and what the root cause is. So, boy, I came to the conclusion that treatment of MGD was not adequate. I came to the conclusion when I look realistically at all the people whom I saw, and I call those who didn't come back in, call those who said they'd come back in, but hadn't come back in, and I looked at those who passed in front of me, the treatment was really, really, really not good. So the next question is, what was the next step? So the next step was that it would be replacement of my bony gland secretions with eye drops. And I had enough experience uh, uh, in uh, research that I had done to know that what we wanted to do is we wanted to basically attach oil on top of water. We wanted to, we, we wanted to build up the lipid layer on the eye. That's what we wanted to do because that stops evaporation. And it's so simple. You just take a drop of oil, you drop it on the table, you drop the same volume of water on the table, come back in a couple hours. You'll be amazed. The water is essentially gone and the oil basically remains intact. So that's what we wanted to do. So what we needed to do was to have a Velcro layer, which would, uh, conceptually, which would attach the oil to the aqueous. And that's called, for those of you who are chemistry majors, you know that those are interstitial molecules, the quasi-surfactants, on and on and on. But you needed them in a manner that, that they'd allow a plane of film. And the film of lipid on the eye really, really, really has to be smooth uh, to within 30 to 75 nanometers, not microns, nanometers. So it's completely, it's just so, so obvious, but, but so complicated. So uh, again, I didn't have adequate funds, but we found that a company we raised, I think, three or four million dollars and started on the next 10 year odyssey. Um, and mind you, up until this time, all the odysseys had been a lot of fun. You know, I had sunk uh, in bankruptcy, and I was still having a good time, I enjoyed it. And I was still married, and I still, <laughs> and I still had a practice, so I had no complaints. Uh, and I was entertained. So um, I hope the next would be the same. But one of the problems was that tear film has literally thousands of molecular species. And one of the people, Tiffany from England, actually conducted these experiments. And when you looked at the total number of molecular species that he predicted, it was 100,000 in all the variations. It was just incredulous. 
Um, so the question that we asked ourselves is how can we evaluate little, literally hundreds of different formulae? Because if you put down a matrix and you wanted to use uh, phospholipids as the interstitial molecule, you wanted to use other areas as these interstitial molecules, you're just faced with just such a host of, and also the different type of oils, should they be neutral, should they be charged? There was just an unbelievable amount of variables. So, what we needed was we needed some method to measure it, and that's when I became interested in interferometry. That's the first interferometer I built in 1985, 2006, and then look review in 2011. And what this tells us really is that if you don't have a metric, we'll never make much progress. And that was beautifully summarized by Kuhn in the structure of scientific revolutions. In the, in the absence of a metric and an objective method of evaluation, fact gathering and development is severely impeded. So what graduate students do again is they spend years and years and years in developing metrics. And that's what you have to do. That's the painful story. And now there's all this business about graduates, about postdocs being exploited as being the, the uh, bonded, whatever. Uh, the indentured servants of modern science, which is unfortunate. So that led us to look at eyebrows. And this was on the bad odyssey, actually, because in that period of time, uh, our formulations created SUD XP, and then the second generation sustained balance. And those are lipids which stayed in the eye for a reasonable length of time. But, you know, as pointed out in the green, the utopian adjunct, whatever you add to the eye, despite the fact that it could be an utopian solution, will never replace the microbial glands, which with every deliberate point inject micropico, whatever that means, amounts of lipid onto the eye. It's absolutely incredible to calculate out the why that, that comes out. So, uh, what happens? Well, eye drop treatments, you know, they were good, but they were not optimal, so the next step was to restore my bromine gland function and secretions. So now I knew I was in for another 10-year odyssey. And the last one wasn't bad, see, because all of a sudden royalty started coming in, and that sort of funded a little bit of the next research. And uh, Brian Holden is the absolute master. That. And I learned a little bit from him. I learned not to be embarrassed by the fact that some of your inventions made money to fund more research. So, so that's good. So the decision uh, that we had uh, was to move forward, and that resulted in my, in my uh, being willing to be a co-founder of a company to attack that problem, which was tear science. Well, um, how am I going to like? Uh, so, just to quickly review the stages uh, in the Odyssey, the first was obstruction was the root cause, manual expression had its problems, drugs had their problems, treatment uh, would ultimately not be drops, but it would be to get the meibomian glands working again, so that was our goal. Well, the first obstacle that we need, or that we, that we recognized that we had was there was no adequate metric to really evaluate meibomian gland function. I mean, how do you evaluate the function of a single meibomian gland? Because if you couldn't evaluate that, you would know metric, and you wouldn't know no matter what you did whether or not you had made it better. And we had no idea of how many meibomian glands worked at any one time, and how much volume they had. We were totally hopeless. We knew, we knew, we knew essentially nothing. So to make it very quick, uh, we invented a device that uh, in 2006, which allows us, it's called the Mybomian Gland Evaluator, and the company that evaluated the system and put my name on it, although I didn't want my name on it. And uh, what it basically does is it, it applies to the lid while you're looking under, uh, while you're looking through a biomicroscope. You apply the same pressure to the lid, 1.25 grams per square millimeter, that a deliberate blink would and you hold it on for a certain length of time, 10 to 15 seconds, and that length of time is the time that is necessary statistically to obtain liquid secretion from the acini at the bottom part of the gland. So you think of the gland as being a, a central duct with the lower grapes, and the grapes are the little areas that make the oil. Uh, that time allows you uh, to do that. 
So what have we learned from all this? Well, the first thing that we learned is that all meibomian glands are not the same. We don't completely understand why it, but what we do know is that the nasal ones contribute probably 60 to 70 percent of all of the meibomian gland secretion at any one given time. Centrally, maybe 30 percent, sometimes 40 percent. Temple, very, very, very rarely does even one work except for athletes. And we also know, you say, what research should be done. Uh, we've done several pilots on the temperature of the lid going across and correlating that to my bone and gland function. And there appears to be a, a definitive correlation between the temperature of, the, of that portion of the lid and the number of glands secreted. We also came up with these models for how many glands you need to be dry and how many you need not to be dry. We also learned something which is, again, is not published, but presented in the post, is that the number of glands, the best predictor of contact lens long-term success is the number of meibomian glands that are function. That's the best predictor. It's that simple. Um, so what we learned, again, is to satisfy Kuhn, the hebometric and an objective method of evaluation fact gathering with severe computer. So that all allowed us to take the next steps. Now let's think about how we restore meibomian gland function. Well, we know that we want to liquefy the material that becomes obstructed in the meibomian glands. We, we understand that. And we know that we simultaneously want to apply pressure. So we know the heat to pressure are the basis of that. And we evaluated many energy sources, and heat proved to be the best method. Not all the science, not all the fancy methods that I thought would work, but just basic heat. And then, again, unfortunately, when we applied heat to the outer surface, the results, again, weren't optimal. And they weren't optimal because the lids insulate the heat as you go through the toxic plate. Okay? And then the meibomian glands are designed to be behind the tarsal plate, actually embedded in the tarsal plate. So it isn't easy to get them heated. And then as you apply the heat along and longer, what you get, you get vasodilation, and the vasodilation acts to conduct the heat away via the radiating effect. So all of those things are a problem. And then, as I say, if we turn here, we see the problem of driving the heat with the warm compress through the lid. Well, in a moment of great clarity, I was working on a patient one day uh, with the research team, uh, and we were uh, figuring ways to increase the heat and simultaneously vibrate the outer lid to drive the heat in further. And all of a sudden, I said, you know, we're doing this the wrong way. We should be heating from the inside. So I looked at the research people, I said, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. I looked at the patient. The patient was an old patient. Uh, for many years, had been my patient. The patient was also modestly old. And I said, if you wouldn't mind, we're going to do something that's never been done before. Uh, and I don't think there'll be any problem. We have a team of engineers. We're going to titrate the heat up. And he was a PhD in science himself. He said, anything you want to do, do it. I'm desperate. So we did it. And we applied the heat, took the heat probe, and I applied it right on the inside. Uh, of the inner lid. And as I'm watching those meibomian glands after about 15 seconds, three or four of them just spurred like old faithful. <laughs> so, man, am I lucky. I understand this now. Went back in the other eye, put it on the outside of the lid, no matter what we did, they didn't open. So I knew the answer immediately was to keep the inside of the lid. And as a result, we developed uh, an instrument which goes onto the eye and it heats, uh, it's a big scleral shell and it fits up against the inner lids and it applies heat completely to the inner lids and then on the outside you have an ear bladder which constantly keeps the pressure and then it pulsates and it increases the pressure and that cleans out the acini while they're being liquefied and it works. Uh, and that's what it looks like uh, again on the eye. So we want to liquefy, express, and evacuate not only the ductal uh, expression, but all the gland contents. And what's even more remarkable is that if you think about 
those of you who treat corneas, we frequently want to debride cornea to get new cells in to let it grow to heal up the current erosions or to uh, deal with basement membrane dystrophy and the results of it. And similarly, we want to do the same on the inside of all of these little round grapes, so the senile. And the results were remarkably good in the FDA trial. Um, we uh, basically tripled the number of glands that were opening um, and actually uh, uh, increased breakup time 50% and symptoms dropped 50% uh, uh, almost to the point where uh, the person was comfortable. Then uh, a duration study was done for 12 months where the individual was treated and when the individual was treated, uh, uh, you looked at the MG score, and the MG score was a measure of how efficacious the glands were. And anything above 15 is uh, probably not severely high. So they started with a very low baseline of 6, and when they were done, they, uh, they were, were, were up in the 17 range, and the symptoms again, even after a year. Uh, were high. You'll notice that about nine months and 12 months, there's a little drop between nine and 12 months. But again, how long it lasts depends upon what are the root causes that cause my bone gland obstruction to, do, to begin with. And one of them is blinking. So, again, well, it took me 30 years from the publication of my first paper to really understand the, the importance of non obvious my bone gland dysfunction. And although I had published in the first paper, and even in the abstract, made a clear point that this was not obvious upon looking with the slip lamp, uh, it, never, it, it never really gained any traction. And I never was a, was a real proponent of it. I never spoke with passion about it. Well, um, in uh, 2010, Caroline Blackie was the first author, and she did a fantastic job uh, developing this paper developed universal uh, authorship uh, because so many people were really interested in it. So uh, it included uh, ourselves, the American team, the German team, and, and a famous ophthalmologist from, uh, from India and to Manam, uh, Ed Hall, and it was published in Coin in 2010. So no matter how good the lower lid looks, you cannot tell whether with the application of pressure, no matter how much pressure it will have, uh, uh, whether or not there will be liquid secretion. Uh, the gland can have a terminal block, and before the sequelae happen, the lid looks perfectly normal. Now, this was a slide on the right which shows the actual obstruction of the duct and the dilated duct. And on the left, you see that this gland, no matter how much pressure you put on it, or these glands do not provide liquid secretion, even though the lid looks totally normal. And those are slides that I believe we published both in 1980. And that was a section uh, on the right that was done by Dr. Henriquez, and it was a patient who had a melanoma, was going to lose the eye, was kind enough to uh, give us his lid after we had tested the lid. So a summary is that all MGD is non-obvious because before it becomes obvious and before it starts to cascade. And it starts with obstruction and it starts with stasis. And non-obvious MGD is the most common form of myeloma and dysfunction. And yet these lids can appear totally, totally normal. And the most important aspect perhaps in the entire talk that I'm giving today is you have to have a method for evaluating function. Are they functioning or not functioning? If you don't have that metric, if you're using your finger, certainly it's better than nothing, but you really don't have a repeatable metric that you can that you can gauge as a as a standard or compare with the work of of others. So I want now to just talk for a moment about a dry eye cascade. In 2007 we presented this cascade that if you have obstruction, it leads to a decrease in liquid secretions and a decrease in liquid layer thickness. That in turn results in a decrease in aqueous layer thickness, which in turn leads to an unstable tear film with all of the sequelae that happen. But the key word here is evaporative stress. Somewhere along the line, you have evaporative stress, and that results in the sequelae. Now, a question you ask is it's commonly believed that inflammation 
is the cause of dry eye. And I would propose to you that that thinking is not sound. That's, it's that simple. Because inflammation is the sequela of a situation which demands defense from the body, which can only be handled by inflammation. So it's important to understand that because treating inflammation itself is not going to resolve the root cause of dry eye. You have to look at the root cause, and there's a number of them, but we've got it pretty well simplified. Now, to really understand the question of evaporated stress, I ask every audience I speak to, to just listen to me for a moment and don't do anything. The first step is I'm going to give you instructions to blink twice and then to stare, to keep your eyes open and stare. So let's just do that. Let's open our eyes, blink once, blink twice, and now everybody stare. And tell me what you begin to perceive during the stays, during the staring process. Do you feel anything? What do you feel? It gets cooler or drier. Anyone else have any other um, reaction? Burning. Burning. That is probably the key word, burning. Burning is the way we're wired, but burning can also be cool. Same story. It, it's, a, it's just a, a variant of how you perceive it, but it is burning. And why do you get burning? Because, we'll go into it later, because the, the sentinels for protecting the cornea are very superficial. And the moment they get air striking them, you get burning. Okay? And that is critical to understand as a point. And it's that simple, really. So now if you go through a more comp the same cascade, when the symptoms start, the moment you have an unstable tear film. And that's what happens. When you're scared, you have an unstable tear film. And there's two routes that it can go. It goes through the ocular surface to the dry eye, causing inflammation. And then you have ocular changes, which can be visible or non-visible. Or you can compromise and you do lubricity, which in turn results mechanically in the upper lid being torn up and ocular surface trauma and damage, which in turn causes inflammation. Now, this is in the very early stages. So all of this is going along, but along this odyssey now, I'm not having much success convincing anybody of anything. Everybody thinks, you know, Corbett's been yakking about this since 1980. In fact, I, I, I got such a poor rating at the Academy one year talking about this that I see he's talking. I didn't make a three. Didn't make a three. Now, that's pretty bad. Didn't make a three. And, and, uh, and the amazing part about it is a lot of people gave me fours. But I didn't make a three. My cumulative average dropped below three. And I was always, you know, pretty high. So I just said, hey, that's the enemy speaking for a couple of years. Well, I got some help because along came the dry eye workshop in 2007, and then came along the international workshop at MGD, which was cheered by uh, the prodigy from Ohio State, Kelly Nichols. So what happened in 2007? Well, at this dry eye workshop, they developed all of these beautifully complicated schemas. They, they, they're just elegant. And they're all true. They're all true. And look at where they put MGD. They just slapped MGD here as an afterthought. They didn't even connect it to anything. And that's where MGD was in 2007. Well, along came a new situation where they had this international workshop on my roaming with this function, 50 experts, you know the game, from all over the world. And they had this fantastic report to the professions in MGP in IOVS, 168 pages, and the conclusion was MGD may well be the leading cause of dry eye disease throughout the world. Bingo! <laughs> <laughs> Boy, the Odyssey looked a lot better than <laughs> Boy, I was, You know, and I went back and I read the definition just like I did today, this long and arduous journey with its ups and downs. I said, Boy, am I lucky. I'm on an upper here. So, and they define MGD. And how do they define it? Boy, they use the word terminal duct obstruction. Boy, I looked at the mirror and I puffed myself right up. Boy, I said that in 1980. So, what happened? And they said, well, you may have clinically apparent inflammation. Well, you know, I wasn't too happy about that. But, you know, 
It was pretty good. You can't get everything. And he said, inflammation, but the real secret is, most of the inflammation that we're really interested in can only be seen with a confocal microscope at 800X. And with 800X, you can see it, as we'll show you very quickly. So, why is dry eye, how many people in this believe that dry, how many people in the room believe dry eye is simple? <laughs> I don't see, how many believe that it's complicated? Everybody. It isn't complicated. It's simple. But we have been led to believe that it's complicated. And the reason we think it's complicated is because there's over 40 tests. My goodness, I spent 10 years on this odyssey developing tests. Tests and more tests. I spent a year and a half of my life on breakup time, developing better methods of breakup time. They are really good methods of measuring breakup time, and I still use them when I'm doing research. They're really great. But dry eye is the result of MGD and MGD's final infinite sequelae. That is the primary root cause of dry eye, as we understand dry eye. And most tests of what? They're markers of a certain state. They don't give you the root cause at all. So all of this business, which is elegant and was necessary to get here, is that clinical signs and symptoms don't correlate. Understood. And the reason is that they're not diagnostic. They're evaluating a little piece of one of the sequelae. So if you had a long odyssey starting with MGD and you had all of these sequelae and you don't know at what point you're evaluating it, you will get all sorts of different answers and different responses. So of course they don't correlate because you're not defining the variables that define the basic condition. There's only two words in the past year that I want to use and that's function and structure. If the meibomian glands aren't functioning, you have a problem. And if they have a structural problem, you either have a structural problem then, which impedes function, or you soon will have a lack of function. So what is function? Does a meibomian gland produce lipid secretion under habitual conditions, such as normal deliberate blinking, and structure? If the structures of the meibomian glands intact, are they normal, or they are? alterations including truncation, including atrophy, including dropout, including dilated glands, including obstruction. So here is a scale that we now use for truncation and dropout. And you can see that the glands can essentially be truncated so they have less than 5%. They have nothing left. They may not even have one acini out of the 20 to 25 remaining. So how, how can you treat someone? And the answer is, you can't restore what isn't there. They're lost for life, assuming that the image is valid. But there's a lot of problems with myography, and a new development that will be coming out gives you a dynamic form of myography, which takes the inside and the outside and it puts them together so you have a lot less uh, false uh, imaging. Uh, and then they have dilation. Now, this is extremely important because if you look here, you can see that the terminal duct is dilated just as the microscopic slide is the section of the lid was. And here you have moderate and here you have severe. You have this massive dilation at the end of the gland which extends back upward. And you have that because there's terminal obstruction. So the moment you have all, all, of, all of this problem, you're never, 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 never going to have a normal functioning gland until you clear up the obstruction, assuming the gland will back up, up regularly. So what are the sequelae of all of this? Well, the sequelae of all this are the gland becomes obstructed, and then you have a reduction in secretion, diffuse, diffuse inflammation. When you have a diffuse inflammation, you have dropout atrophy, then you have all these changes, lid inflammation, which may be non-visible, then you have nerve damage, and now terminal stages of coronal hyperalgesia and neuropathic pain. And neuropathic pain, phantom pain, the amputated leg syndrome, about 20% of all the patients who are referred to me as a final end stop have neuropathic pain. And we can now diagnose that by putting them into a gog, creating 100% humidity, obliterating all external circumstances, keep them in there for hours or days, and if it doesn't improve, 
and you know you have neuropathic pain. Now, these are slides that um, were done in a collaboration with uh, the person who has the best darn focal microscopy lab probably in the country, Pedro Hamra at the Mass Eye in here in Boston. And here, normal epithelial cells, bad epithelial cells, MGD, these are corneal. Normal corneal nerves, compromised corneal nerves, all that scatter because of the light scatter because of the tissue. And what do you have here? You have dendritic cells floating around, 800X. You look at the meibomian glands, same story. And here you just have this massive fibrosis and these massive changes and the massive number of dendritic cells all around the meibomian glands. Now, the next question. And this is something that I have been very, very, very keen on since actually 1995 when I presented my first talk on this. I think that's when I got the poorest marks I've ever gotten. And the question is, if you have dry eye, if you have dry eye, does the lacrimal gland upregulate? So when we were staring, when we were staring, and our eyes began to burn and sting, does a lacrimal gland upregulate to provide tears to the fence? Of course it does. We all know that. And what happens if it does that chronically? What happens is whenever you work, overwork any gland for any length of time, <coughs> you exceed its anthropological design. It breaks down and it begins to become inflamed because that's the only defense it has. And then the atrophy and the lack of function fall. And there are analogs for this. I believe that's the whole story with type 2 diabetes. The minute you put that stress on it, bingo, you can't make it. Maybe if you lose enough weight and you pull it off early enough, you can recover, and maybe you can't. And there's, an, uh, there's also another analog with the adrenal glands with, with licorice. So when you have continual evaporated stress, you get dry eye signs and symptoms, but you have lack of gland hyperactivity, then you get the inflammation, and then you test them. At that stage, you say that eye is aqueous deficient. Sure, it's aqueous deficient because everything's evaporated away. So this whole concept of aqueous deficiency, of stimulating lacrimal secretion with secreta drugs, you know, you'll notice that the people who have those kind of drugs are now shifting towards immunomodulation. They're changing, they're changing the wording of the market. Now, we talked about Chester. Chester has done some fantastic studies. He was the first one to start on mybography with infrared. But what Chester has also done um, in a recent paper with, uh, with a, quote, postdoc uh, in the foreign land, um, he put mice in a low humidity and drafting environment to stress them. And what did he find out? They increased mybocyte production. Now, what are the mybocytes do? They're the cells that make the meibomian gland secretion. So they increased them. And then they got morphological changes. They got obstruction of the glands. And then the quality of the meibom went down. So chronic exposure to desiccating stress depletes the mybocyte stem cells. Okay, And early aging gland atrophy and dropout. So my comments to his great work is obviously this is what starts the cascade. Anything which causes evaporated stress in a modern society, video screen staring, the whole story, all of that causes evaporated stress. And think of the implications of contact lens wear and all conditions which cause evaporated stress. Monstrous, 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 monstrous. So we now understand what we should not be doing and what we should be doing. And what we have to do is we have to stop this evaporator. We have to really stop this uh, evaporator stress. It's just, it's just so obvious in retrospect. And what puzzles me is in 1995, I knew that happened to the lacrimal gland. But even though I worked in a meibomian gland, I was a prisoner of my own bias. And it took someone else to do the experiment to prove to me that I was, that I was right but that I had underestimated the entire situation, which is comical. Now we said we get back to evaporated stress. And this is the slide which I've been using since 2011. This side here is a lot of that came from Perry Rosenthal, uh, who 
who was an optometrist, uh, who's an ophthalmologist in Boston. And I should just mention to you all that I've nominated him for three or four consecutive years for the Shapiro Award, because I think he's made the most outstanding development. But nobody thinks he's entitled to the Shapiro Award. They think that, that, that what he's done, is, I guess, is inadequate. Um, and then uh, Pedro Hanra, whom I mentioned, with confocal microscopy. So Perry's words were the universal, inciting, exogenous, noxious stimulus. Aren't those beautiful words? You couldn't beat them if you tried. Excessive aberration, and then he traces it down, what happens, and then you hit the cornea, nerves and cells, and you get corneal hypersensitivity, hyperalgesia. And this is if it lasts long enough, obviously, not with anybody. And then you can go to uh, neuropathic pain. Well, Hamra has gone into the area of what happens when tissue changes are not obvious. And he's publishing several papers with which our group of co co-authors on, on the whole situation of what happens. Uh, that is also non-obvious. You can't see it. No ophthalmologist, no optometrist, no researcher in the world can see this unless you use a confocal. And there you go. So uh, in summary, you know, there's visible tissue changes which we see staining, Little white epitheliopathy, which is a big factor, the anatomical changes, and now we have a line of max, max. But then remember the non visible that you can't see. So when people come in with symptoms that you can't see, they're not crazy. They're not crazy at all. They're just living too soon. If they waited another hundred years, they'd come in and be recognized immediately. So if we think about what are the sentinels of pain, well, these corneal nociceptors, they're the pain receptors. They regulate lack of secretion, and then we go right down the story again and what happens. And that explains so many things, including all the pain that will come with LASIK either in the beginning or maybe after two or three year hiatus with no pain. Remember, 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 everyone is at risk for MGD and evaporator stress. Everyone. It's just a question of their environment and what they do in their vocation. The system that we have anthropologically was designed to work 500 or 1,000 years ago when we didn't have these demands upon us. Is, is, is dry eye increasing? Is the prevalence of dry eye increasing? Well, the answer is no, it's not increasing at all. We just have better methods of seeing. Long, long, long. Yes, we get paid more attention. Yes, we have better methods. But the reason it's increasing is because people are doing what young graduate students do, using their eyes in a manner for which they're really not they're really not designed. So the science clearly shows us, it shows that evaporated step is both the result and a further instigator. It shows us the contact lens where glaucoma meds, ocular allergies, age, diabetes, both rosacea and many other factors. But our contemporary position must be that the primary mechanism of action is initiated by any activity that decreases the frequency and efficacy of the blink and increases evaporative stress. So what do we want to do? We really want to treat uh, the root cause. Now, it's been known actually since 1880, not 1800, not, not, not uh, not 1880, but also 1888 by the man named Dario. That if you have problems, you have to evacuate the microneurons. And he had a unique method where he modified wood clamps and he placed these wood clamps on the eyes and he reported in great minute detail. I, I don't read Italian, so I haven't read this personally, but I did read the translation of the paper. And it's with great delight that he explains how over the course of 40 minutes you can titrate the name the amount of force up on the on the clamps, and ultimately we'll see material come out and will relieve the congestion of the glands. So uh, I don't know what his follow-up for patients was. <laughs> I would think it was a high risk. They probably just had alcohol, but maybe they had the alcohol. But all this is compel compelling evidence for the need to evacuate um, obstructive material. Um, so what we do know. Um, is that the mygomian glands really deserve to be famous, but MGD deserves to be infamous. And that's the way I think. 
and we have to know that MGP is truly the root cause of the majority of all dry eye. In the past, we've treated it reactively when people come in and have a problem with treatment. But we have to move forward so we have a preventive uh, culture where we take a look, we look at their structure, we look at their symptoms, we look at their function. So I can foresee the day when a 12 year old or 10 year old is walking in the office and you recognize in the office. Before you see the patient, you'll have my barber who come on, assuming the mother wants the best of kids and is willing to pay for it. And then when they come into you, I'll you or your technician to do that to you. And you'll say, this is the baseline, that we've got, just like a dentist takes a baseline. Now we're going to follow up and see your child in another year if they have no symptoms. Then you repeat that, and now it still looks pretty good. Maybe in one or two more years, you start to see the dilation happen, and then the function goes down from 12 glands are open. The six glands are open, and you say it's now time for the function. If we don't do this, we'll have disastrous consequences. And I feel as confident about that state as I felt about anything that I've ever done in my profession. It's got to happen. It's got to happen. Yeah, there'll be people who don't embrace it, there'll be costs, there'll be all of this, but society is so much better saved and so much better served by that philosophy than by any other that it's only a matter of time. Until it, until it takes over. And I've been involved with developing this concept of liver flow, and that's that's the way it should be used. It shouldn't be used to treat people on the basis of symptoms. It shouldn't be used to promise people with no glands left that they're going to have a relief of their neuropathic pain. That's madness. But but for those who have troubles that can be resolved by by removal instruction. It really is there. You know, everybody should have it. But in a society where you have to pay for it and people have limited resources, uh, one has to ask why they do it. So everyone they should be treated, students, anyone who is subject to evaporated stress, people particularly at risk of any of you, if any of you run a dry eye clinic, you'll notice that the individuals who have will be very, very high prevalence of lightly complected individuals with light eyes, blue green eyes, and light hair. And the best test is just ask the person, if you go out in the sun, do you burn? And if they burn, they're really a risk of MGD. And we've collected data on about 600 people for this, which we will acknowledge. So, so again, contact lenses, age, glaucoma, and all of these things. And these were these are just a list of questions uh, that we should ask ourselves about MG functionality. Anybody wants it, I'll be happy to provide a copy. But, um, but one of the big uh, uh, one of the big developments that we've had is to understand the other factors that drive inflammation in the eye. So if I ask anyone in the audience, can your eyes close at night so that any ophthalmologist or optometrist or team of them who examine them says, yes, this person does not have a lack of balance. Can you have that condition where your eyes are too shut, closed, and yet air gets in between the lips? That plagued me for 27 years to the point where you know, I thought about it, but I get signed up at my desk at home. Why AM symptoms? And there is an answer. And it's this core black and white test. If you apply light, uh, for years I was conducting experiments where I put light up in the inferior forms and the inferior forms and see if it came out between the lids. And these, these methods were not effective. They were not effective at all. But if you take a peanut illuminator and forget how bright that area is, because that's an artifact of digital photography, and that we get, we get overexposure. We basically bounce the light from 12 o'clock completely around the tassel plate. And it ends up on the non tassel areas. And if you look at it, there and there, there's no light coming out between the lids. But if you dim the light, you can see that there is, even though the lid is totally closed, there's light coming out between the lids. And there's an absolute correlation between that and AM symptoms when people wake up. So what's happening is all night long these individuals are basically having evaporated stress because the meibomian gland shut down, there's no oil in the eye. 
they have an evaporative stress. And as a result of having an evaporative stress, they have an inflammation and they're going backwards. And that alone is enough to cause a critical bubble. And how many individuals in the audience prescribe ointments for individuals at night, despite the fact that they're blue? Now, don't be embarrassed. And is it effective, Dr. Myers? Sometimes. Sometimes it's very effective. Everyone that's effective has that. And it can be partly effective, but not be doing an adequate job with these people, and they then have to sleep in a car in addition. And the bionic scar will just get rid of the problem, just like that. Consider NGP first. NGP is the root cause of 86% of all of our or more. And the only thing, the only area, the only other blue cause that doesn't fall on the energy Now, bi is very complex to the influence of bi energy D. But energy D itself is very, very simple. So the blue cause is simple, structure and function. We should always look for MGD in any article exam. We should treat immediately when it's detected. We should treat early and aggressively. And the future is very simple. It's evaporative stress. Treatment, reactive, maintenance, preventive. We'll be converting to the dental model on uh, uh, within a limited amount of time. We'll see more and more uh, practices uh, who are really adopted shift to the dental model. We've shifted a little bit to pilot it, and uh, it works, at least it works in Boston. And then what causes all this will be environment, thinking, steering, thinking, thinking, computers, and anything which causes evaporative stress. Riding on a motorcycle without goggles, riding with the window, but all of these things cause evaporative stress. So uh, I think that, that this is really a revolution, it's a real change. I think in reducing all of the complexity to simplicity that this long policy has brought me at this point in my career to. You know, could it happen anywhere?